Okay, so hi again everyone. We're starting the second part of the program of today. I forgot to mention Kairit in the introduction <laughs> because I was too stressed. Uh, so but here is Kairit Kao from Estonia. I'm very happy uh, that you came. I think in Baltics it's very rare that researchers are doing this industrial relation research. So I'm very interested in you, what you're going to tell. And I guess that's all. Yeah, you thank see. you. Thank you for inviting me. And yeah, in, indeed, I guess I chose a, like a good speciality because nobody else is doing it even, no matter how badly I do it, they still need me. <laughs> uh, so uh, a bit about my background. Uh, I did my PhD on Baltic Organizing Academy. Uh, I didn't start my PhD doing it, but just like during one of the interviews I did with the trade unionist, they mentioned that, well, we actually do li now like some kind of organizing and the Finnish unions are supporting us. And then I, then I thought that, oh, it's fantastic. And then I uh, refocused my, uh, my thesis on that. Uh, so the background is that I know much more about the Baltic Organizing Academy and the situation in Estonia and how Estonian unions have cooperated with Finland uh, around organizing. Uh, but then I was asked to write a comparative paper about what is happening also in other countries. Uh, these uh, these uh, two other initiatives, the Baltic Organizing Alliance is the continuation of uh, the uh, organizing academy. And then in the Visegrad group, there is the Central Europe Organizing Center that does Quite similar thing, also use the foreign like financing to uh, conduct uh, big organizing uh, campaigns. Why I'm uh, telling the background is that yeah, the, I haven't done uh, loads of uh, research on the other two, but I guess I did enough that they accepted the paper for the <laughs> transfer. <laughs> so um, it's forthcoming. And uh, it's the transfer issue that is dedicated to the 20th anniversary of uh, uh, Central and Eastern European Union, uh, Central and Eastern Europe countries joining the EU. So we have been there already. <laughs> Those like Estonia and, and some others uh, already 20 years, that's quite, quite a long time. Anyway, they wanted to see like how uh, uh, the European integration has influenced the position of trade unions uh, in, in our region. That was the background. And uh, in addition to that, I do some other uh, labor relations related research. I've done some, something about platform labor and posting of workers. So if anybody wants to cooperate, I'm available probably if you get the funding from somewhere. But um, uh, yes, um, maybe also just to know the crowd, any, any one of you is part of any of these initiatives? Okay, good. Then I can, <laughs> then you just believe what, whatever I, I did. <laughs> um, uh, so I thought I will try to answer these uh, three questions. Like, I will soon talk why, why it's important or interesting that this kind of development has happened, but so how has this transnational organizing become quite widespread and also institutionalized uh, within a part of the uh, trade unions in, in our region? And uh, what kind of main outcomes there have been, both positives and more like a shortcoming? Uh, shortcomings and maybe then just some ideas, of course I don't have very good answers, but some ideas about how to overcome some of the limitations that have come with, uh, with this kind of uh, using foreign uh, uh, finances uh, to, uh, uh, to conduct the campaigns and, and stuff like that. This is this similar to the previous uh, presentation. I don't have a lot of graphs, only this one uh, depressed depressing one which also shows which shows the trade union density uh, you see the uh, CE countries are mostly on the on there on the lower side of the, the graph with the lowest trade union density rates 
uh, Estonia leading the way, as it usually does. Uh, only around 4% of uh, people uh, being, 4% of employees being in, in unions out of the total workforce. Uh, they are a bit like old data in a way, but there just wasn't any newer ones. Uh, for some countries there was. Interestingly, I looked at that for Lithuania we had data from 2020 and actually for the last years it has increased a bit the density, so congratulations to, to you. But for others there wasn't. And why, why, is, why is it important for the organizing, of course, you know, we know that uh, in, in uh, Central and East, Eastern European countries the trade union density is especially low, that membership numbers are very low. And that would kind of, uh, uh, what, what would follow logically in my opinion that trade unions will focus a lot on, on increasing the membership numbers. Because, you know, membership is very vital to the survival of trade unions, of course. They mostly depend on membership fees and so on. And also, even if unions are able to uh, secure better gains for workers without high, high membership numbers, they can do, uh, do it through, for example, collective bargaining, uh, having uh, connections with political parties, doing political lobby and, and such. Uh, higher density still indicates that uh, unions are more le legitimate. Uh, membership is a, this kind of a vital power resource. You can't take it away when the external environment changes. One day political parties in power are your friends, the next day they are not. So membership is always like this kind of a important uh, thing to have. And uh, why we have the low membership density, there are a lot of reasons. There are the historical uh, socialist legacies, uh, they are called, uh, but then also the post-socialist legacies, how the uh, societies were transformed after the transition, uh, of course the extensive neoliberal reforms and how we ended, in what position we ended up in the global economy. Uh, but also, I would argue that, you know, the strategic choices that trade unions made uh, had something to do with it as well. You know, the agency of trade unions, uh, whether they put more emphasis uh, on, on one or the other strategy and these kind of uh, issues. And, uh, you know, if we think about the Central and Eastern Europe uh, and think about what trade unions usually do here, what are their this kind of a dominant or, or, and traditional strategies, you probably have uh, experiences you know, you are mostly seem to be a very progressive crowd, but you have uh, experiences with the more traditional unions as well. Like, what kind of things have they focused on mostly? What, what do you see? Collective bargaining, I guess, trying to keep what they have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some, something else? Political lobby. Yeah, political activities. Yeah. Of course, from Poland, <laughs> especially relevant. Yeah. yeah. Commission. Yeah, trying to get into the policy making processes, right? Uh, indeed, so uh, one thing you didn't mention is that servicing, so providing varieties of, variety of services to their members. Uh, this is, of course, uh, depending on the union, uh, it, it's very much dependent on the resources that they have, and it's uh, also related to the legacies, uh, what they have always done, for example, when we went to the Tallinn University of Tra Tallinn University's trade union uh, before we like, kind of uh, took it over, they their like mo main thing they did was uh, have a Christmas party for the children of the employees of the university. So something like that, you know, this is always been done. Uh, this is how we I don't know keep the existing members. But as as they uh, said, uh, as you said that of course. This kind of a being a social partner to the employers has always been the aim at what, what the, the traditional strategy has been. So, you know, you want employer to take you seriously, you don't want to confront him too much, but you, you know, you just want to be heard, 
to come up with some kind of compromises and the same logic with the state representatives as well. You know, you should have a saying, but not something too radical, at least in, in, in countries like Estonia, just like say something, uh, have some kind of influence. Uh, in, in some countries, political alliances have been more uh, important than in others, and in some countries, public protests have also been more widespread uh, than in others. Definitely not in Estonia, also not, probably not in other Baltic countries, as for example in Poland or Slovenia, with more, uh, more active this kind of a protest uh, culture also related to the uh, legacies. Uh, and uh, organizing as such hasn't been done that widely. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, some unions haven't like recruited members. There have been a lot of recruitment, recruitment activities as well, variety of methods for that. Uh, mainly like either company specific activities or sector specific activities. Here now the Polish unions maybe stand out a bit because uh, Solidarność started this big kind of a comprehensive organizing campaigns in the, in the late 90s, right? And, and the other uh, union, I guess, OPCC or whatever it's the acronym, sorry, <laughs> as, as well at some point. Uh, but in other countries, uh, this kind of a big organizing campaigns have been relatively absent uh, in, in the 90s and also in the 2000s. Uh, so, then something happened. In the uh, uh, 2010s, uh, this kind of a transnational organizing campaigns became a thing uh, more widely than just only in Poland or the, than just only very uh, few isolated cases here and there. And uh, we know that this exists. We know that uh, the Baltic Organizing Academy and its uh, uh, successors exist, and we know that uh, uh, Central Europe Organizing Center exists, but you know, we, there's not a lot of research about it. I have read about POA and uh, I don't know, Adam Rosowitski has write about, uh, wrote about uh, some, some other organizing activities, but you know, this kind of a transnational dimension and comparative dimension has been relatively rare, and that's also probably why I needed to <laughs> write this uh, thing and also decided to do this talk. Uh, because, uh, first of all, like starting organizing campaigns, you need to overcome. Uh, some of the bar barriers I will talk about soon. And then on top of you add the international co collaboration of trade unions, win which in itself is quite tricky. So you put these two things together and somehow uh, um, unions ended up doing it. So it's a pretty fascinating development. Uh, especially when I like found out that, okay, Estonian and Finnish unions do this uh, together, but like the background is that Traditionally, Estonian unions have been very like modest, social partnership oriented, and uh, Finnish unions, their model is also based on, you know, collective negotiations, uh, they have high density levels, they haven't needed to do organizing much, uh, their role has been relatively institutionalized, so employers know that they have to take them into account when uh, uh, negotiating wage levels and employment conditions, but somehow decide, they decided that let's try organizing. So culturally it hasn't been relevant in, in either in Estonia and Finland and there my, from there my interest uh, uh, started. And I have uh, um, touched briefly already these issues. Uh, if you look a bit back, like uh, what, what the literature says, uh, first, uh, like uh, the, the Western European uh, literature about the uh, unions uh, shifted towards like the re revitalization or strategies in the 90s, let's say after the neoliberal turn where they saw that trade union density is falling and trade unions find it harder and harder to uh, gain much. 
And uh, organizing has been one of the ideas, then okay, that is how we can revitalize our, our union movement. Uh, the other options have been like servicing, international links, political action, uh, coalition building with other uh, uh, social movements, for example, uh, partnership with employers, organizational restructuring and, and stuff like that. So organizing uh, and uh, transnational organizing puts like two strategies basically together, the international cooperation side and organizing. And uh, I still haven't def defined organizing, but I, I will do it now. Uh, what I mean here is, like sometimes organizing and recruitment are used as the synonyms. You know, you recruit members into the unions. But, but when I talk about organizing and when these three initiatives talk about organizing, then they, they rather mean uh, the organizing that relates to the organizing model unionism, which has its... Uh, uh, background in social movement unionism, it was born in Global South, then it was imported to the USA and uh, then to the uh, Great Britain and other, neo uh, other liberal market economies, then also tried in some more coordinated market economies. And so basically the model transfer, uh, traveled like across the, the globe. And uh, what, what differentiates it to, from uh, uh, just like recruiting members is the side that, you know, you should increase membership levels, but you should also empower members, you should activate them, uh, you should mobilize them, organize collective action uh, to the improvement of like labor conditions, but also around other wider social uh, issues. Uh, so the, this is uh, the definition and the background. And, uh, and then the transnationalism side, like simply put, it's just involving unions from uh, multiple countries to uh, commonly do something or do something in multiple countries. Uh, and uh, in, in one of the papers I have written together with colleagues that if you want to implement organizing, transnational organizing, you have to overcome this kind of a double barrier first, like to shift your focus from like unions are usually very national minded, shift the focus into a more like international perspective, a transnational perspective. And we know that there are a lot of problems when unions try to go global or international. And the other thing is just in context where, which are more like social partnership oriented or like servicing oriented, you shift the focus to organizing, with, which takes your focus and resources away from the other strategies you could do. So this kind of uh, background. Now I need to drink, otherwise I will lose my voice. That usually happens with me in the end of the lectures sometimes. Uh, me. But back to the graph that I showed you earlier, you know, why organizing might be a good idea in the, in the Central and Eastern European countries. Uh, we have very low union membership levels, you know, we should do something about it and organizing was initially, organizing model unionism initially was about like having the base for the unions, uh, you know, strong bases. And uh, uh, then our unions don't have a lot of other available strategies that would be super effective, uh, history or like time shows. Uh, for example, if you're a union and you're like, okay, I will try to uh, uh, focus on changing policies, uh, in, be involved in a policy uh, process, then you know you, you can do it when the policy makers, the politicians, want to involve you. You know, but uh, as you are not very strong in, in other ways, then they can just. Uh, ignore you if, if they please so, or like, are your demands heard if you are involved in a policy pro uh, processes? Uh, in, in some cases we have seen like uh, unions have been quite in ineffective uh, to getting uh, through their agendas. For example, in, in the uh, changes in the labor, labor le legislation in Estonia, they have been pretty uh, unfavorable to unions. And uh, yeah, uh, so 
in that background, you know, organizing seems, of course, a good idea. But as I said, it hasn't be, been done that extensively in the first two decades of the, uh, gaining the, regaining the independence in, in most of the cases. Uh, why? Uh, we don't have a union culture, probably, uh, that's very favorable to organizing. It's not, uh, in a lot of cases, being very confrontational towards employers is not really, very well um, uh, respected, seen as a proper <laughs> way to act, of acting. Uh, active members are not a case very much. Uh, uh, we have the problem of, uh, like, you know, finding people who would be willing to uh, be active and so on. Also, like, uh, organizations have like in inertia, like they have always done things a certain way and they haven't uh, mostly organized in, in our region. Uh, because that would also mean that uh, you have to change the way you see the role of union, you have to change the way you uh, do things. Active members are actually pretty annoying uh, for uh, union leaders, they can be because they demand you to do things and help them and, and all these issues. Mm -hmm. And the, the main thing, of course, uh, lack of resources. And this uh, talk is uh, a lot about resources. So, because whatever in innovative things you want to do, somehow you have to find uh, resources uh, to do it. And organizing is a very resource uh, intensive uh, thing. Uh, it works well if you have paid organizers who can devote a lot of time doing the job. You need, uh, you need to coordinate all the activities and, and all these things. Um, and it, it takes, uh, takes a lot of resources. Uh, and uh, and the other, one thing is the culture and the institutional environment that we are operating and the other important part is the, the role of union leaders and activists and all the literature points that organizing is usually adopted as a strategy when there is the, those leaders or those activists in a union who have learned about it usually through some kind of international links, international cooperation, international uh, seminars from the organizing unions and then they have been trained into organi uh, organizing model ideas and practices and then they're like, okay, let's, let's try it uh, out in, in this region as well. And this uh, yeah, happened with, the, with these uh, three cases as well, but I will talk about it a bit later. Uh, European integration uh, also, you know, for trade unions, it hasn't been maybe like a super uh, beneficial development. Uh, the European common markets, there are a lot of problems. But one good thing, maybe we can look at uh, from a positive side, is that uh, you know the old EU countries, uh, the Western uh, European countries, they uh, uh, gained uh, like uh, they took a more like a beneficial attitude of uh, supporting Eastern European countries because of the market interdependencies. Uh, they, like, for example, the Nordic countries straight away in the 90s uh, thought that, okay, we have to help the Baltic ones, otherwise we will be in, the tr in trouble soon because, you know, the multinationals and, and capital and uh, labor moves from one country to another. So strong uh, unions uh, through, uh, through the Europe are a common good. So this is something that, uh, you know, we can, uh, we can think. Uh, and uh, this indeed has motivated a lot of uh, cooperation activities between Eastern and Western Europe, uh, European unions as well. And of course, European Union has, uh, well, Europe has all these uh, union structures. Uh, we have the uh, trade Union Confederation, European one, and uh, we have the subdivisions, regional uh, union cooperation bodies, and uh, these are also important places where you can, you know, uh, develop close relations and common ideas and kind of plans for action. So in that sense, European integration has also been like a positive uh, for the labor uh, labors. 
Uh, there are also some funding that the European Union uh, offers, but uh, is it good for uh, starting organizing or not? It's a bit complicated because the funding is more mostly for developing social partnership related activities. Uh, so away a bit away from organizing, just to develop some kind of a common things with employers and, and, and these kind of aspects. But if you are like a clever, then you can use the funds for, for the beneficial activities, uh, capacity building to some kind of trainings. And, and some unions have used, used it kind of a, for organizing activities, just um, hiding them a bit uh, from the... Uh, framing them a bit differently. Uh, but, but the main problem with the different transnational cooperation uh, initiatives are that they tend to be very short term, they tend to be project based, uh, and of course they tend to be directed by the funding logic. So there are like these uh, problematic uh, dimensions uh, as well. But basically this is like a bit of a background if something stays unclear, you can ask. Uh, and uh, very briefly about the, the methodology as well, and about the, its limitations. Uh, so all these three uh, initiatives that I'm looking at have uh, very important common characteristics. So they uh, try to implement this kind of Anglo-Saxon organizing model, unionism, ideas and strategy. Uh, they have all involved multiple uh, Central and Eastern European countries in two different regions. They have all de de uh, depended on international funding either from the uh, foreign unions or from the European level uh, Union uh, Federation. And they have been quite like long term and uh, as I also argue, they have become quite institutionalized so that nowadays these unions see that organizing should be done somehow and, and uh, using international support for it is a, uh, one of the viable options for that. And maybe not so uh, interesting right now, but like data sources, I have used different documentary materials and expert interviews. With the Baltic Organizing Academy, I have different perspectives. I have the perspectives of the Finnish unions, so of course the Estonian ones. In Estonia, from the, I have interviews with the high-level union officials, but also organizers, activists, like different levels. But for the uh, uh, two and, and uh, 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 GOTS, or GOS, I don't know how you pronounce it actually. Uh, I only have like a top level uh, officials uh, view, uh, which is, you know, uh, it has a certain limitations. There might be more perspectives uh, that I don't have. Uh, with GOTS, it's uh, actually very interesting. I knew a few organizers who worked there, but uh, they uh, were not willing to give me an interview. They said that we prefer, you know, to keep the things uh, like a bit secret or so, so it wasn't even like a possible to do a very, uh, very good uh, uh, data gathering around the things, but their director was willing to give me an interview, so they, they gave a very, this kind of a top level, uh, top level view. And they have published some documents, uh, some uh, results and, and things like that. Me, so this is the background, and this is the origin story of, uh, of Poa. With Poa I was very lucky, there was an Estonian trade unionist who was super kind, he gave me all the materials, public and private, and all the letters and everything, just do whatever research you want. Uh, so Poa was, um, uh, it, was started, it started in 2011, but uh, this uh, document was probably in 2010, it was written in, a, in an airplane mm. where um, one Finnish uh, trade unionist and one Estonian one, they ended up in the same airplane. They came back from the Baltic Sea Trade Union Network meeting and they started to talking about, you know, the horrible situation that we have with trade unions in the Baltic countries. 
also that we have been cooperating since the 1990s, but you know, things are still so bad, like what is going on? And uh, I don't know, I can't read it mostly, but, uh, uh, but the logic was that, okay, we have tried this and that, and uh, you know, we haven't tried organizing model yet. Let's, let's try it. And uh, yeah, they uh, decided to uh, like group, uh, have a group of uh, organizing minded people who started to convincing others to, to try it out. And I tried to put, uh, make some kind of a table that would s summarize some of, the, some of the key things about these initiatives. Uh, so Baltic uh, Organizing Academy was active until 2017, then uh, they ended that project, but they started uh, the next year the Baltic Organizing Alliance. Some of the previous PA members continued being there as well. So these two are, as the name, uh, name shows, they are Baltic, uh, Baltic unions uh, involved and funded by the uh, Nordic uh, sectoral level unions. And uh, yeah, with Central Europe uh, Organizing Centre, it, it has been active since 2016, it's still active and in 2000. Uh, 2023, it has organizing activities in Poland, Hungary and the uh, Czech Republic and right now they have uh, around 30 organizers yeah, working in different sectors. Um, about the funding logic of these activities, uh, BOAS uh, are based on the annual fundraising, so basically every year uh, this uh, sectoral level unions come together and decide like uh, if they want to fund next year organizing activities in, in the Baltic countries. So let's say that Finnish uh, retail workers union says okay we find, uh, fund the hiring of organizers in Estonian retail and then they decide what kind of companies will they focus on. Usually they have the connection, you know, the mother companies from uh, Finland or Sweden and, and this kind of logic. So the Estonian ones or the, the Latvian ones, they have to find a partner from the Nordic countries uh, to fund their activities. Uh, the, the Central European Organi Organizing Center, they have a bit different logic. Um, it's funded mainly, it's, uh, it was started by the uh, Uni uh, Europe, uh, which is a uh, uh, big uh, uh, service workers un union, uh, union federation of the European level, and uh, they, uh, the funding is uh, mostly from uh, by the Uni score department, and some additional resources then are provided some other European or international. Uh, uh, union federations. And uh, what else is important here? Ah, okay, why, why these initiatives were started? Uh, here, in both cases, uh, the role of activists who believe or who had studied the organizing approach in some other contexts and who believed that it might work in, in these, uh, these countries as well. They had the, the, the main role in, in starting the, these initiatives and, uh, and kind of uh, this realization that, okay, nothing else has worked. Uh, why, the funding, uh, why the funding from the funders' side? Uh, the Finnish uh, unionists uh, we have interviewed, they, they have highlighted, you know, the labour market the interdependencies that, yeah, you know, capital and uh, labour uh, goes freely uh, between our countries and low membership density is a problem uh, for us as well and all these issues. But the other part of the story is that, you know, they already had a very close uh, connections, close cooperation. And uh, that was also uh, one of the motivations uh, why the, the Baltic unions were willing or not willing to join the academy, uh, initially at least. 
uh, because you know they were already quite friendly with each other. If a friend asks you to come and join, then you try to do and <laughs> do that, and uh, and uh, that is uh, that is how it was. Uh, from the, about the Central Europe Organizing Center, as far as I, I know, then the, you know the logic why Uni was willing to try it out and fund it was that the region was attracting all these multinationals and the local unions were not you know, strong enough to, uh, to unionize these. Uh, so uh, it was like a good, good idea for the common good to, to try to find, uh, fund unions in this region to help them organize. Uh, and there are some gaps because, you know, I haven't, uh, I don't have everybody's perspective. Uh, but if you are still not convinced that you know personal relations are, are super important in these kind of things, I, I guess the, the organizers of this event already know that it's a very well organized event. You know you have the social activities uh, together. Then you know uh, uh, what, what what is called like this identity. Uh, work processes, you know, where you, you uh, bring people uh, closely together, they develop some kind of a common understandings and, and all these uh, issues are very important. I don't know what's, uh, what Estonian guys have with uh, drinking beer in, in sauna, that's a, probably an Esto Estonian thing or Finnish thing, uh, that, uh, that, you know, you make uh, very important connections and uh, also decisions in a, in a sauna. Uh, my colleague, a colleague actually has written an article about how Estonian manage, managers, very different topic, but like uh, still the same logic that Estonian managers argue that, yeah, you know, most important business decisions we make in sauna. So it's apparently a thing. Uh, yes, but pro probably other contexts work as well. You don't need to organize a sauna. Anyway, even those who were very skeptical about organizing model uh, unionism as this guy was concretely, uh, and he stayed uh, rather skeptical, but he was trying to, you know, uh, trying it out because, willing to try, try it out because they were old friends, how do you say no to them, you know, uh, things like that. Okay, this is a very a full slide. Uh, but, uh, but a bit about those organizations then. Initially, the BOA core group, they managed to bring together uh, 32 uh, sectoral level organizations, quite a big number, uh, then both like from the Baltic side and from the Nordic side, uh, uh, who were willing to then come uh, and join this, uh, this Baltic Organizing Academy. Mostly, most, most participants, most eager participants were from Finland and Estonia. This I also would, would say is about already existing uh, very, very strong cooperation and also like Helsinki and Tallinn especially are like super connected uh, with each other. Uh, so it makes sense in, in every way. Uh, and you, 11 Finnish unions, uh, two Swedish and four Danish unions, uh, initially provided the resources to uh, higher organizers and also like some strategic help how to approach the multinationals that were, you know, the, the bases were in their countries and, and stuff like that. Uh, now, the, both BOAS had the logic that the, the organizers were hired by the local sectoral level union. For example, the Estonian Service uh, Workers Union hired organizer with the funding of the Nordic, uh, Nordic uh, Union. Why is it important mm, and why uh, GOTS did it differently is that uh, the organizers were hired by an organization that didn't exactly get what organizing is and it was a bit different that, uh, than the things that they usually did. So it created some kind of a tensions, you know, the new ways of doing things and the old ways of doing things. And uh, that, that's another big story, but I, I don't go into it uh, that much. But yeah, the uh, uh, Central Europe Organizing Center has uh, one central uh, 
like office and they hire organizers themselves and then they like rent out the organizers to unions who want to use organizers so it's a different uh, structure and those organizers can then just focus on the organizing work they don't have to deal with the union politics it has probably its advantages uh, nee. And uh, last uh, interviews I did with, uh, with Poa uh, 2.0 were in the beginning of uh, 2023. Uh, then uh, they had seven member organizations, two from Estonia, two from Latvia and three from Lithuania. And uh, they have had some successful campaigns, at least that what they told me. But what was specific in that kind of uh, time when I did the interviews is that Basically, nothing much was going on because the lead organizers, organizer decided to quit uh, and they couldn't hire any new lead organizer because the Nordic uh, unions didn't approve their choices. So basically, they have had some kind of disagreements like who is a good candidate uh, and also, the, the Nordic ones weren't super happy with the results. Uh, that's an important thing. Uh, I will get into that a bit more. And, uh, and the, the uh, Central Europe Organizing Center, uh, the, the director said that the campaigns are usually like the partnership of three, so the uni provides uh, funding. Uh, then they have a partner union, uh, that can be UNIS affiliate or, or, or some kind of alternative union who wants to do organizing campaign uh, and then they uh, provide them the expertise of the uh, COSU organizer. I guess I touched the... This is also a very full slide, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I guess I didn't know what to cut. Um, uh, but uh, what, what is also maybe important about these things that, yeah, this kind of a transnational organizing has become a bit of like institutionalized. Low. So it's, it's something like we should continue because we already have the practi practicalities figured out. We already have trained enough people and, and, and these kind of issues and this kind of organizing mindset and the culture has spread. Uh, not like super wide probably, but uh, wide enough. And, uh, you know, organizers uh, also have, uh, have their own like distinctive identity, especially if you're in a context like Estonia, where the unions have been very like traditional old school, and then you have these new ideas about, you know, workers' power and Actually, we don't have the same aims as the employer has, and you know, if they get profit, we don't get higher wages and stuff like that. Surprising, but yeah, this uh, this, is, this hasn't been like super mainstream in, in Estonia, and uh, and uh, yeah, this group of people has formed. Uh, of course, uh, there are those who don't approve using so radical strategies and stuff like that, uh, but, but still. And, uh, and even like, I told you that in the beginning of 2023, the 2.0 uh, situation wasn't so rosy. They had the problems with getting further funding, but still like they was quite optimistic. Like they said that soon we will have another meeting with the Nordic ones. We will uh, discuss starting uh, BOA 3.0, <laughs> a continuation, and we have already like some cooperations lined up to get the funding. Why, why they want to continue? I mean, it's just a very uh, pragmatic uh, thing, you know. They don't have still enough funds to fund the organizing activities themselves, and they also see that if they use some alternative strategies to increase the membership levels, it doesn't work that well. So they kind of see that they need organizing, but they also need funding because uh, it hasn't become self-sustainable. Uh, self uh, 
what is maybe also interesting that you know there are uh, several uh, several people who now are in uh, some kind of leading positions in different universities who different organizations different unions who have been previously related to uh, to Boa, or in in the case of course as well uh, so in a way these ideas have been spread a bit wider And, and this is also one of the quotes maybe uh, you, can, you can read that also shows that they have, even if like, you know, the membership uh, increase hasn't been so, uh, so uh, big, then still it's a kind of a positive that the culture of organizing has, has become um, uh, more wider even among those unions who are not directly part of this, uh, three, these initiatives. Uh, I feel I have been talking already quite a bit, but I have a few more slides, not that many. Uh, I don't have like a lot of data about what kind of like a material uh, uh, success has have these activities uh, brought. But uh, you, I have uh, studied uh, progress report, reports and, and based on the interview testimony, uh, of course, uh, these campaigns have been successful in, in uh, increasing unionization rates, even if not like uh, super high levels. Uh, there have been a lot of companies that have um, been unionized and uh, company level collective agreements have been signed Generally, the improvement of, uh, of working conditions and uh, uh, self-confidence of workers uh, after, you know, union, unionists have activated and empowered them. Uh, also, like, unions have been more invisible in, in media, especially, at least in the case of Estonia. And they have started cooperating more with each other, doing, like, uh, joint campaigns at the national level, but also like international cooperation is important. Uh, what I also uh, briefly like hinted that, you know, that the stories, uh, the ways about thinking about labor relations, these ideas uh, have been diversified a bit related to uh, bringing this new, uh, new way of uh, doing, uh, doing campaigns. And, and uh, a lot of people have been trained uh, on, on these uh, principles. Uh, but what is always more interesting is like the problematic <laughs> sites uh, and they are of course related, uh, related to the previous slide. So membership increase is modest, it is uh, mostly company specific. Unions haven't been able to uh, sign a big uh, sectoral level collective agreements which uh, seems a more like, you know, uh, think that would influence, uh, influence the economy more. Um, and as uh, the Boa uh, two people said that, you know, organizing has been quite successful in unionizing workers, but, you know, they still haven't figured out how to keep uh, uh, the workers in unions like long term. So, you know, you can organize them, but at some point they just leave uh, or so you know, staff uh, turnover is uh, quite high and, and so on. And uh, also important in, in our con context is, you know, the lack of uh, this kind of a collective values and activism uh, among uh, workers, among... Uh, uh, so, you know, first you need to do a lot of work and that is why also I would argue that just recruiting people into unions are not a very uh, successful strategy because you, you need to do more work with people for them to act actually become active, active members or members who would stay. And uh, these activists, uh, these uh, officials I have talked to, like recognized it that it's a thing in, in our region and we have to just uh, take it into account that organizing here is more painful than, for example, in the UK, because in UK, as the cost director said, that it's, you know, people have already, already decided either they are pro-union or they are anti-union. You go and talk and you understand, but in, in our context, you know, first you need to do a bit of work uh, so that people would first like, figure that out and then you can 
influence them to go on the right way and, and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, the other like big problem with these uh, initiatives, uh, especially with POA, has been that you know the yearly fundraising is a very precarious thing. Each year, you don't know if you have funding for the next year. Uh, your organizers were, were also um, employed with one yearly contract, which is a very problematic thing. Uh, I know more about the Estonian case again, but there were even like some health issues, you know, people with this, it's a very stressful job, it's a very hard job, and then you are also insecure about the future and, and everything like that. So in that way, the, the funding model is not very sustainable. GOS has a, has a much better uh, and secure funding logic, but you know, how to influence <laughs> Nordic unions also to do something like that is a very uh, complicated thing and uh, probably will not happen. And actually one of the poor people told that they have like talked with, with uni that maybe uni wants to also include them in, in, into their funding, but uh, uni was more interested in, in this region, Poland, than, than that. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> Uh, not right now, at least. Okay, now I come uh, to the conclusions. Uh, yeah, I mentioned, you know, if you st want to start organizing in this region, you have to overcome a bunch of barriers. There are cultural uh, aspects, there are institutional aspects. Uh, and, uh, and still, you know, that, that, that can be done. But uh, we have to... Uh, Acknowledge that you know you can can never have a super high union growth here, and uh, and that always raises the question: Okay, how do we finance the further activities? Uh, the transnational option is is good, I guess. You know, global solidarity is a positive uh, positive thing, I would say, or or at least European solidarity between unions. Uh, but it comes often with strings attached, so uh, especially with the POA we see that, okay, uh, you know, somehow, although the Nordic countries have been funding the POA activities like 10 years now, they still don't uh, understand or want to understand the local context that well, maybe, uh, because, you know, we don't have like... A, high amount of people who would be super capable doing the organizing work. We don't have, uh, you know, loads of active union members and, and uh, campaigns are very painful and, and slow and uh, this is just something... Uh, it doesn't mean that the unions are doing bad job necessarily, so it's just something you need to take into account. I And, you know, uh, it's not something uh, our uh, context specific that organizing is difficult, but, but here we have to just take into account the, the, all the legacies and, and weak uh, union culture um, uh, that uh, we need to do more work about uh, with the workers. So all the uh, awareness raising activities, campaigns, social campaigns probably are needed to accompany with the more... Uh, uh, company or sector specific organizing uh, approaches and, and uh, social movement unionism uh, involving also uh, other uh, like civil society actors and, and things like that uh, hasn't been very uh, widespread in, in our region as well so this is something something to consider uh, Agnes mentioned like a way forward uh, thinking about like how to improve the standing of unions, so that that was a good, uh, good idea. And okay, this is the final slide of conclusions. Don't worry. Still, like I don't want to uh, end with a very uh, negative note. Uh, organizing kind of makes sense still, at least uh, in my opinion, and the transnational support for it makes sense as well, uh, because. Uh, you know, organizing campaigns, uh, they, they have included uh, 
paid organizers who can just devote their time doing the work. Uh, they can, these campaigns, if they are done centrally, they can mobilize a very big support. You know, different unions, uh, unions from different countries uh, can uh, provide their support. It's, it's very important. Uh, all these dominant strategies that have been uh, uh, more widespread uh, depend more on the external environment. And if it changes, uh, if it gets worse, then... Uh, then you know, the strategies become less and less uh, effective. Me, I just uh, had one uh, slide about few uh, things, if you want to read about union innovation, a bit older book and then a bit newer article, just my doctoral thesis who wants to read about POA a bit more, and one uh, Adam Rosowitzki's paper about uh, union organizing in the region as well. And now I think I have been talking around like the, an hour and this is my best slide anyway, so thank you. <laughs> I guess we can open for questions now, yeah, if you don't mind. Uh, so, anyone has questions? Because I always have some, but... Oh. Oh. Uh, outside of your scope of research, but uh, what caught my hand in the very beginning was showing you in this plus zero. Uh, and then Iceland seems to be like just a complete outlier with 90%, which is like almost Soviet Union levels of like, you know, union membership. Do you know anything about how, why is that the case? Could we emulate that? No, we, we can't, but I don't also know why. <laughs> Uh, is anybody Iceland expert here? Uh, because I probably have read about it, I don't remember. If they have some kind of a mandatory thing. Uh, uh -huh. That makes sense more, yeah. Because, you know, Iceland is very outstanding in gender equality and all these issues. Probably they just made, you know, you have to, <laughs> you have to. <laughs> to There's 300,000 people, so it's easier to make them. <laughs> so Iceland is, has mandatory membership and also they are in the system of minimum wage negotiations on the sectoral level. So all the countries that have minimum wage on sectoral level uh, have higher union uh, density than countries with minimal wage on the law country-wise level. Uh, so, I think those are the reasons. Yeah. Yeah. It's a comment, maybe I was reading about Lithuania, this uh, thing of Lithuania, like researching your kind of... One of the points that connects with your question that she was saying that because there's, there, were, there were so many guarantees uh, by the law, so that the unions didn't have what much to do, so like if you have this big kind of list of labor laws and guarantees that were granted by law, but of course they are not mm. followed probably because there is not big representation in the workplaces, so they're, but still like the unions then play on this law and then, mm. and then another reason why they are kind of not so much interested into growing the membership or like going to these spaces that are not comfortable for you it's because they also have this properties from the socialist times and they rent it and part of their income comes from rent mm -hmm. so they are kind of okay even if membership decreases i mean until they now, were but yeah. it's it has run its course now yeah it's now <laughs> it's kind of uh, changing but now yeah. it's, but i mean back like like a decade ago, still the membership levels were higher and, you know, in the 90s, the membership levels were still very high because they started dropping like that, but in the beginning they had from the legacy of the, the Soviet times and even the old unions still just continue to exist uh, with higher levels of members, but it's just now it's, as you saw, like 4% in Estonia, that's, there's nowhere to go anymore, you know, it's, yeah. And also yeah, with the legal changes that all the changes in employment uh, law, they have gone now worse. Uh, 
we did have uh, also like the le legislation from the 90s which was quite secure but as you said uh, it's not that it was followed all the time but you know um, so what future do you see for organizing in this region which is based on your research on this one and your doctoral thesis mm -hmm. like, what is the future that you see can be speculative to, yeah, I mean, I have to be uh, not, not good at predicting future. I don't have these powers, <laughs> but uh, I mean, um, th there will probably be uh, like a wave of activism. There's like there's nowhere to drop anymore. It's just so bad, and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, it's complicated. You know there. As especially in the beginning of Boa, there was a very active group of young uh, labor unionists, uh, but uh, they struggled a lot with the uh, internal politics of the unions. They struggled a lot with taking over the unions. I know we have done it at the university. We also took, took over the old union. Sometimes it, hap it can succeed, and we see that it's happening a bit here and there. But you know it's so slow, and some of them just like gave up and quit and, and went away from the labor uh, movement because it was just uh, so hard. And especially like you know, okay, you know that uh, negotiating with employers is hard, unionizing people is hard. But if you have to uh, constantly work against your own union who wants to undermine it, that's something else. Like that's a very uh, damaging uh, feeling. Uh, so. I guess uh, you know they could start uh, something, uh, something more from the scratch, and here, as you have done, like things like that. In, in Estonia, that's not happening yet, but you know we can still be hopeful. <laughs> uh, but I, do, I don't have like uh, super high hopes for unions every, anywhere, but uh, on the other hand, uh, when things go super bad, maybe we have these kind of alternatives here and there popping out and we should somehow more also focusing on the global labor unionism because you know we need global uh, global uh, actually some kind of global agreements that would be followed and uh, global minimum conditions but if it's happening that's just what i want to happen but i, I don't know <laughs> oh. Is there anything besides just signing solidarity for them to support our struggle? Is there some kind of benefit that they get from mm -hmm. supporting others? Yeah, yeah, as I mentioned, you know, the, uh, they see that because of the free movement within the European Union, uh, that's if, uh, you know, as, I, again, I take the case that I'm familiar with, it's uh, the most familiar with the Estonian case, you know, Estonian people, workers are not unionized, so a lot of them uh, have been working in Finland. They go there uh, also to, not knowing anything about the unions, not caring about unions and so on. So all already Finnish unions saw that as a big problem. You know, they, they need it for them to have the culture of unionism or at least something. Uh, so uh, they wouldn't go there and accept whatever, uh, also would go there and join the unions. And that, that has had actually started to happen at some point like the construction union in Finland, they established the migrant section where also a lot of Estonians are active now and, and stuff like that. And the other part is that their companies, uh, the Nordic uh, origin companies going to Baltic countries, especially like the retail where they have done a lot of campaigns, also hotels and stuff like that. We don't have a much heavy industry, but, uh, but uh, services, uh, yes, and uh, they s go to, to Baltic countries and they don't, um, you know, negotiate with, uh, with the union and uh, they start undermining also banks and, and stuff like that. So it kind of uh, hurts, uh, hurts the, the Nordic, uh, Nordic ones as well. And also like the solidarity part is uh, it's somehow, somehow important, although we have seen it can be not, not as good as well, for example, with the banks. It, the, 
in the Sweden, the, the, during the crisis, the Swedish bank didn't cut the benefits of those employees in Sweden, but they did in the Baltic countries, and the unions were fine because they were, again, willing to secure the, the core workers, like their conditions. So, you know, this is always the employer strategy to, to put them against each other. So this is something needs work to overcome this uh, us versus them uh, mentality. And if you have these close connections, then it's much easier, of course. institutionalization of unions is something that should be like pursued and would be good um, or mm. to the contrary and this could be like a point of discussion that maybe like de-radicalizes and, and, and adds to a like, depoliticize and make these yeah. unions less political like like in my experience I'm a public servant and I was speaking to my union leader and I was like he was like oh yeah come join the union I'm like oh cool like what are you doing you know like are you organizing like, like any protests like what's the reason goals and they're like Oh, you know, we just sometimes like meet up for like coffee, and then we take you know we take you once a year to like a you know a resort or something. And that's pretty much like the extent of it. Even though the union itself is strong and very institutionalized, mm. so is that something that should be pursued, or maybe is it better to keep it something like mm. the very first one, which is completely non-institutionalized? Mm. But I guess they get to do like you know, cooler stuff. Take it to resort. I mean, yeah, that's. <laughs> That, I mean that's a very good uh, good uh, point. Uh, it's uh, there is this term, the curse of institutional security. Uh, like you know, if you have achieved the position where you know you are included and uh, you know the management invites you to have coffee and discuss problems and things, you know, uh, you might get too comfortable and Finnish unions actually. Uh, also started doing organizing based on the organizing model uh, at some point because they saw that the um, institutionalized position is not bringing any more like proper gains for them and they were like okay we should uh, do a bit more militant stuff now, now as well. Uh, it's, I guess it's good until uh, you have a leadership who cares about workers, what workers want, you know, democratic enough for union. Uh, I've seen it a lot uh, that, uh, you know, some unions are totally yellow, but some are like kind of yellowish uh, that also get for themselves, the leaders, something from the management and, you know, uh, regard the, uh, the others. So there is always this uh, possibility that unions, let's say, become lazy because they have achieved the position and are willing to... Uh, the most fascinating thing still, I think about it during the crisis, that some of the Estonian unions, they were willing to re-sign collective agreements where they agreed to lower the wages, you know. And it's just okay, you know. <laughs> at, uh, at least you are willing to uh, negotiate with us, let's negotiate. But is, uh, is it something to be proud of? <laughs> I don't know. So if you are like a very, uh, yeah, People come and are easy to mobilize if the employer is acting nastily usually. So that might be considered as well. Yeah, yeah maybe I'll just give some comment about the global agreement you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier. It's like a very slippery slope as well. Because we no, I mean, yeah, the pro I, meant, I didn't mean those agreements that exist, you know, between with the multinational corporation, corporations, uh, okay. I mean something that actually would work, but yeah. Yeah, no, because they, we, our organization say that we've been collaborating with Unicare for the past three years, and Uniglobal in Europa, and they are working in this giant corporation for PEAS and FURA, which is uh, yeah. care homes and uh, care services, and they made a global agreement with the French headquarters in, in Paris, you know, then they tried to test this agreement in their local you know, countries in Czech Republic, Poland, Croatia and it turned out that this global agreement was not followed by any mm -hmm. local level you know, countries and when they went back to the management to uh, France they said oh we can't influence that, you know, I'm very sorry, you know, we signed this so uh, there is no substitution for 
building yeah. local workers power, yeah. you, you can go around this with, with the agreement yeah. or anything. If you don't have the power, then to actually enforce it, you know, on the ground. I'm just wondering if you could bring in examples of concrete trade unions or, or yeah. uh, concrete sectors in, yeah. in the Baltic countries where this organizing yeah. approach has been used and mm -hmm. The uh, service uh, sector union, ETCA, probably you know the acronym, uh, they did it in um, Viru hotels and uh, in uh, Rimi, uh, the retail uh, shops uh, there, uh, for example. And then in some logistic companies, they have organized few lo logistic uh, places. What else? Some um, manufacturing companies as well. So basically, yeah, some man manufacturing sector, private services, and uh, and transport in transport in logistics mainly. These were the campaigns I know more about. Yeah, I, I know in, in Litu Lithuania or Latvia, which one was it? It was in uh, construction as well. I think if I you know. Yeah, right in Lithuania, no, that There, there should be uh, several, uh, several campaigns, so if they haven't been visible at all, then of course that shows a problem with the approach, because you know, if you don't advertise it, and then it stays only like a very local victory, but you know, somehow you know, have to make them bigger. Uh, in, in Estonian case, uh, oh, also banks, uh, they uh, got the funding to organize Estonian banks at some point, and they have used this strategy also, like, if the company is not willing, the local one is not willing to sign an agreement, they go to, uh, to the Nordic countries, they go there, they stage uh, like a protest and stuff in, in front of their building and the local union then helps them and, and that this kind of a shaming uh, strategies, which you can do if you have the connections. Yeah. But uh, I mean, the, generally the campaigns have been too, too small. You know, if you have one organizer focusing on the whole Rimi chain, for the whole Estonia, uh, that's crazy. That's just too crazy <laughs> to bring a big uh, change. Uh, yeah, and I know I went with a guy organizer to some um, some of the shops to do uh, like a participant observation. It's uh, it's extremely hard. Uh, also because you know. You have to work on the people there a lot, but then he goes during the, when the shops are open, when the people are working there and then trying to discuss with them these issues and, you know, then the bosses are somewhere and, and it's all very, uh, very hard. Yeah. So they actually, how about we found the union that we were working in Rimi, with ah, Rimi. the union and they were like, yeah, we're With some unions, it can be that they are in a like comfortable enough position. They have been promised something, and they can't, you know, do anything more militant. And that's probably a problem. And, uh, in some cases, also the poor organizers, they like went and saw that there is a super passive union who don't want to do anything, and then they just did another one in, instead of that, which. But yeah, the generation chain, generational chains and everything, who knows, maybe it's a good, it's, it, it, it steers it in a more positive uh, direction. Yeah. I still have one question because now the way, um, because you're focusing also uh, uh, on these types of organizations where this kind of uh, knowledge about the organizing model is somehow transmitted. Yeah. But it seems uh, that this approach is very much dependent on this, uh, the ones with the knowledge who enter an organization, like a workplace where they may not work by themselves, and then the problem is that one person cannot organize yeah. and everyone is in it. But from what I understand, the whole point of the organizing approach is that then you talk to this one worker and say, bring your friend and the other one brings No, of course. You know, like, they try to do yeah. that, yeah, yeah, to... Uh, but how does that, I mean, my question is, how, that, how does that work out? Or is it that in the end it's still dependent on this so-called activists or the educators or the organizers? 
competitors who do it as their main jobs and actually this, in a way, whether this approach functions, no? That it actually uh -huh. creates this kind yeah. of... In, in the end, I had more like higher hopes because also the Central Federation in Estonia joined the BOA just not like a, not just as a participant to, to like join their trainings and stuff like that. And they included like organizing ideas also to their shop stewards training model and stuff like that. But I don't know, the, the Central Federation steered a bit away from that militant strategies and, and I don't know. And uh, yeah, the activating members has also the interviews from the 2023 show that I don't think they have still figured out how to achieve it. So it's still too person dependent. If somebody figures out how to do it, let me know as well, because, you know, <laughs> our university has the same problem, which just, there are those activists, and if they would disappear, mm -hmm. it's just falls down, you know, you have to have this continuity, but uh, how to do it, uh, it's very hard. Constant sauna, I guess. <laughs> But now we have organizers will discuss here. Maybe they have overcome these problems. We will hear. <laughs> uh, I, I also wanted to ask, what effects did you see like with the pandemic on it? Because like at least in the West, they called it like the new like labor shift and whatnot, like the shift in the balance of powers and then labor is back in the rice union that is increasing all this. Have you seen this in the Baltics? The, the, I'm not sure about the brought anything positive, rather, you know, they didn't go around anymore that much and didn't meet them. And, you know, the, they also mentioned that uh, they tried to do some kind of meetings with the web uh, communication thingies, but that's not the same, you know, you can't actually <laughs> empower people <laughs> through the, I don't know, video conferencing and stuff like that. And also the, the cost director said that, you know, we have to take into account that these years we basically didn't achieve much, so on the contrary, it, it seemed that it that didn't bring anything good. I don't know, maybe, you know, people's just, service workers just tried to survive and others who could were just behind their computers, uh, away from everything, so I don't know.